Trashomaniacs. Gearheads. Welcome back to Geo Gearheads. This is episode 328. We're going to be talking about puzzles once again with our special guest, Poker Luck. I'm Daryl W4 for the vacationing Chris of the Northwest. So, Poker Luck, thank you for joining us and welcome to the show. Thank you. All right, let's cut right into it because I think this is going to be a, a kind of big show. Uh, ZQX emailed actually he did the form from the website uh but recently he's been helping a friend create puzzles for a series of caches near south 35 23.00 east 192 or 149 i'm sorry 00.000 usually i have a large number of puzzle ideas up my sleeve but this time i found myself struggling to come up with ideas i always strive to do something new or a little different when i make puzzles which has made things more challenging. So far, I have managed to make 26 new puzzles for this series, while my friend has made 50. The plan is to deploy another 32, and therefore, another 32 puzzles are required. So my question for yourselves and your guest is this. Where do you go to get inspiration for puzzles, especially if a large series of puzzles is required? So this, I thought, uh, kicked it off well because we've had a lot of questions about series of caches. And uh, Poker Luck, you've done a few series of caches. Yes, I've done a few series. Uh, uh, just recently, I put out a series of 40. Uh, I combined it with GeoArt. Uh, every 10 puzzles makes a question mark. So I have four question marks out there. Um, if you get them all, you get a nice little GeoArt out of it. But uh, I intended it to be a little bit of a tutorial. A lot of my friends, a lot of my friends are very good at puzzles, but I have some friends who would like to be better at puzzles or they might have felt intimidated in the past. So I wanted to put out a, quite a variety and teach people how to teach people how to solve puzzles. So the philosophy was that I encourage people to work in groups. Uh, if they're having problems, they can talk to their friends. Um, work together, find that I didn't mind giving out hints, but uh, I encourage them to, to make it social. So, yeah, I had the same problem. I needed to come up with 40 puzzles. And I had a few that I had in the back of my mind, but um, I needed a lot more. Well, I think one of the things that can either help or be a hindrance is to have that theme. And the one that you're talking about, that series is all about getting people uh, uh, solving puzzles and giving them a variety. I had just done some geo art where it was all puzzles based around Star Trek and not, not the typical puzzles that you might think, cause it's interesting. They had a lot of them where you just had like a word or two that you had to plug into the checker. And then the checker gave you the actual coordinates. If you got the right word. Yes. So having that theme can really help because then it's just a matter of going through and sticking with that theme and solving or making a bunch of different puzzles to uh, uh, go along with that. But at the same time, it can also limit you where, okay, I'm running out of material on which I can make a puzzle. Right. So it's kind of a catch 22, but I, I think a theme would help. And he didn't mention if there was a theme to this one. There was no special theme to it. I wanted a I wanted a large variety in uh, in difficulty and theme. Um, like I said, I needed to come up with forty, and so uh, I, I relied heavily on on Cully, Cully Long's book, How to Puzzle Cash. I found that extremely helpful. What I did is I sat down and um, I didn't read it in great detail because it's a very good book and go, is very thorough, but uh, I kind of skimmed and I went through and I just made up a list of the ones that really struck a chord with me. And, uh, and, I, had a, and I got a lot of extra ones because I, I found out as I was making up my puzzle, sometimes the puzzle didn't work out as well as I thought it would. So having a few extra on the list was a great help. Um, so when I sure. was done, and that's where the friends come in handy too, is they can help 
beta test those and see if uh, you know you've got something you think might work but when they get, actually get their hands on it it's like yeah that's not going to work cuz you know people are going to find like another answer that also works but gives them the wrong uh, final right right so um and and we you always have the problem that uh to me it's a simple solution but other people don't think so or i i, I think it's a great little diabolical evil puzzle and somebody finds it with very quickly uh so you you have that problem too um but uh i i found it was a very good very good reference for that um, yeah great uh, great resource that uh, anyone who's not into puzzles or into puzzles either way should probably have because it, it's it, you don't necessarily run into all of the puzzles that you can in your area when one of those pops up chances are it came from that book or at least it has something similar to it exactly it that book will have a good lead to it uh actually another one that uh, uh came up uh in my head while we were discussing this was the uh, uh puzzle cache a day blog uh that we've talked with uh, uh team ajk jennifer of team ajk a few times on the show and she goes through a whole bunch of puzzles and bunch of different variety so right. pouring through that for some ideas would also be a good idea definitely not as uh easy to get the ideas out of it as like the how to puzzle cache because the how to puzzle cache is specifically for that whereas uh the how to wait the puzzle cache of the day sorry yeah. i'm getting all these titles confused uh is more about finding the cool ones and talking you know and trying to let you figure it out and then talking it through. Right. I, d I did something a bit unusual. Um, I, uh, when I first put the puzzles out, I, I left it alone. I didn't give out any hints. Uh, if people contacted me, I didn't, I didn't provide hints until someone found it the first time. We have, a, we have a very strong first to find community here. Once someone found it, um, I went back and put a hint on the cash page. And the hint in almost all cases consisted of the page of Cully Long's book that you go to, to get the, to get the hint to find, to find the solution. A lot of people very found nice. that very helpful and it encouraged yeah. them to look through the book some more too. Sure. Well, and how many people probably picked up that book when it came out, got all excited, flipped through it, read it cover to cover, and then haven't gone back to it since. So right. now they have a reason to go back and look at it and rediscover it. Well, and I, I think I accounted for a fair number of sales on that book <laughs> because when people found out that I had used it and that a lot of the solutions were in there, they, they went out and got a copy of it too. Sure. Yeah, I, I am not very good at puzzle caches. Uh, so it, it's one of those things. I don't go back to it often, and I probably should. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the features I really like about it is when I when I run across a cipher, I sometimes have a difficult time figuring out what type of cipher is it. And and there are so many different kinds. They have a very nice flowchart in the back where they ask you questions about what it looks like, and you work your way through the flowchart. And it really does help identify what it's likely to be. That's a very handy tool. Absolutely. Well, you know, one of my problems is. I typically try to uh, solve puzzles when I'm like out somewhere, uh, you know, grabbing uh, lunch or something like that, right? Not in front of the book. I don't have the book with me. I'm out. So I keep hoping that he's going to come out with like a Kindle version or something like that. But uh, as of now, I think it's only available in the uh, spiral and the uh, uh, paperback. Uh -huh. As far as I know, that's correct. So I keep hoping that <laughs> he's going to come out with it. He he had at one point been looking at it, but the trouble is those uh, Kindle um, uh, and similar ebook formats tend to not work so well for things like that flowchart. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. So it's one of those is it even going to translate well? And I, I think the bottom line was he never was able to get it to work well. All right. But yeah, I, I want a more portable version than the uh, spiral. And I do recommend if you get it, don't go for the paperback, even though that's on 
nice one, go for the uh, spiral. Because the nice thing with that is it opens up and lays flat. Lays flat, yeah. Yeah. And I can't tell you how many times when that became available, it was sitting out at the uh, uh, meet and greet with people using that as the reference to solve the new puzzles that were just released at the event. Great. So that's why that's handy. You know, if you want the paperback, cool, get it for home and then get the uh, uh, spiral bound so that you can keep it in your uh, cash bag. Oh, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) They also had an idea of talking about uh, um, the uh, Going Caching Cruise uh, series to uh, get some ideas. Right. Uh, if you've never been to Going Caching, it's a fantastic event. Uh, it centers, it's centered mostly around puzzles, and they, they run the gamut from easy to hard. Um, but they have some quite difficult ones. And uh, uh, Jim, one of the half of the crew that runs Going Caching, is a real puzzler. He just loves puzzles. And so one thing, uh, when, when you got that email, one thing I recommended was that they could might try contacting Jim and Andy, who run Going Caching, and see if they had any tips for him, too. They might be able to come up with some ideas on how to do series and that sort of thing. But uh, I love Going Caching. Uh, it's just, uh, it, it's many days of just uh, solving puzzles. And uh, it, it it really helps to be in a group of people. I get, get a couple group, uh, get a couple friends together, uh, because you won't think of all the ways to solve those things. It helps if you've got one person who's analytical, one person who's intuitive, and that sort of thing, and you you cover each other that way. So, uh, going caching is a fantastic uh, puzzle learning event. Oh, it absolutely is. And it's different types of puzzles that you might not typically encounter in geocaching as well. And it culminates in the escape room, which is nothing more than a big puzzle, basically. It's a big puzzle, that's correct. Yeah. yeah. So great event. If uh, anyone can go to it, I recommend they do. And when we went uh, for the first time last year, we were blown away at how friendly everyone was. And you're just walking around. It's like, hey, we're going over here. You want to join us? It's literally that friendly. And people just yes. form these impromptu groups. And they'll break up as well, kind of the similar organic route. Because, oh, we got to go grab lunch now. We're going to go grab this other set of caches. So it's real easy laid back. And it's amazing how much help you get just walking around town yes. doing like the lab caches or whatever and it it is an amazing event and it, the, the puzzles have a huge variety there's, there's quite a few of them some are extremely difficult it's unlikely you would solve the entire puzzle yourself so as you said you can walk around and ask people um, somebody might give you help with this part somebody might give you help with the other part like you say everybody's very friendly and very willing to help uh, that's one thing i really like about it yeah yeah an amazing event uh, ben in the uh, chat, though, is asking if you find that puzzle caching is becoming less popular uh, than in previous times. In his area, they are uh, getting fewer visits again. Okay. Uh, actually, in my area, I think they're becoming more popular. Um, I think that's the same over here, too. There was a, a period at which people would not touch puzzles. But yes. over the last few years, it seems like it's ramping up. We're seeing more puzzles, and more people are doing puzzles. And especially with Planetary Pursuit, its interest in puzzles has just exploded. Yes. Yeah. So people who weren't doing it at all have suddenly decided, oh, I want to go back into puzzles. We'll see if that actually continues. But yeah, yeah they're not going to get the same in this area, the same kind of traffic that a traditional cache has. I'd say just very loosely because I haven't actually looked at it, but I want to say you're probably looking at about 10 to 20% of the fines of a traditional. But it was probably even like 1% for a while. So that's a huge bump. It's getting better. Uh, We're getting more and more people here. uh, We're in the Tennessee Valley geocachers here. We're getting more and more people interested in it. Uh, we've We've had events. Uh, for showing people how to do some puzzle caches. 
Some people in the, who in the past have said they never pay attention to puzzles are becoming more interested in it and participating. So certainly my experience is, is that it's getting better, uh, getting more interest. Um, we've got a We've got a local puzzler, Lullaby for You. She was, she's been on your show before. She loves the gadget caches. Um, mm -hmm. She puts out puzzles on the uh, web page too, but she likes to have the gadgets out in the field. And she makes fantastic ones. She's a CAD designer, and, and uh, her husband, uh, her, her a relative is a machinist. And between the two of them, they make fantastic gadget caches. So. That's a good way to get people involved. They're not too complicated, you know. Uh, you can eventually figure them out, and people uh, learn that hey, they can solve these puzzles. So she's become very popular around here. Well, and you get uh, really cool caches like the uh, uh, um, gadget style caches, and it motivates people to do the puzzle caches even more. Right. Um, there's a guy locally, uh, old Foggy, who. Uh, he puts out puzzles certain times a year. He puts out a pie uh, every March 14th. He puts out a pie cache. He's been doing this for many years. We, 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 are, we really look forward to the different ways he looks at pie. <laughs> and he's had some pretty tricky ones, but uh, we figure them out. Uh, you know, we had him on the show as well. I think he was the one who had uh, done something with a lobster trap. Is oh, I have not also? seen that. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, are, I might be thinking of someone else. There are there are puzzles around here I haven't gotten to yet. Yeah, they, well, there's all kinds of amazing inspiration that people have uh, created puzzles from. But uh, yeah, that, that was one that kind of struck me as uh, memorable. And I wish yeah. I could remember more about it, but that's really about all I do. I, I like to do birdhouses. I have a, uh, my brother and I, make birdhouse gadget caches. Uh, he, he started it up in Illinois. He calls them the Angry Birds caches. And I have identical ones down here. I call them Angry Bird Fly South, Flying South. So uh, <laughs> those are very popular too. That's a type of puzzle. Yeah, we'll, we'll t probably talk a little bit more about those later on. Mm -hmm. But I've, I've kind of wanted to uh, do a uh, um, free library uh, gadget cache. Because it seems like the free libraries are popping up, and we've got some of those, like the TARDIS uh, libraries that people have been making into incredible caches. And it's a library and a cool cache. Yeah. So that's what's kind of struck my fancy. And it's like, uh, how can I make something like that happen? So I, I, mm. I got to figure that one out. Yeah. Let's talk, though, about that uh, We're All Crazy uh, GeoArt series, because that's the one you mentioned that's really kind of designed to. Uh, get people puzzle solving, but it's yes. uh, the shape of four question marks. How did you go about planning the locations for those uh, uh, actual caches then? Well, to get them to be the question marks. Luckily, we've got a nice four lane divided highway that was running um, not far from town, and there weren't very many caches on one side of it. So the caches themselves, the physical caches, are basically a power trail along that highway. And then about every uh, oh about every two mile segment, um, there's ten caches, and that amounts to one question mark. So if you solve them all, you basically have a have a forty cache power trail along that highway. So they're very easy to they're very easy to pick up. I mean, the the caches are not a challenge to find. Uh, the the challenge is in solving the puzzles. That was what it was intended. Right. So basically, you're just taking like the series of ten, compressing that into roughly the center of the uh, uh, ten caches, just in the shape of the question mark on the, the roadway. Shape way. of a question mark, correct? Yeah. Yeah. So there's no, no like really weird finagling that had to happen because it's just right there at the side of the road. Right, and I I made one question mark and kind of adjusted the the points until it looked good. And the, the, the highway is almost straight. And so I just shifted it two miles to make the next one. And it was very, once I had the first one down, it was very easy to make the, the next three. So I just shifted them over. And a reminder for anyone who doesn't remember, when you're doing a puzzle cache, the uh, final has to be within two miles of the start point, you know, of the actual published location. 
So that's what really kind of throws some of the uh, geo art for a little bit of a uh, tizzy is that you have to figure out locations within two miles of that point on the map where you can actually hide the cache. It, it can be a challenge. Uh, one problem we have in East Tennessee is, is none of the roads are straight. Um, you, you never know what direction they're going in. Uh, some of these are on the sides of mountains. They don't have much of a shoulder. Uh, we have fewer options for where we can put the physical cache than in some places. And that, that adds another challenge to the geo art. Uh, my brother lives in Illinois where it's perfectly flat and all the roads run north, south, east, and west. And he doesn't have as much challenge in figuring out where to put the caches. Yeah, and around here, our big problem is usually finding enough spots available because of the cache density. Yeah. It's either spots where you really don't want caches or there's so many caches there that there's not enough spots to do any kind of artwork with the uh, yeah. uh, points. Yeah. So it is a really big challenge. Uh, let's go into the actual puzzles, though. You said that they uh, came from the uh, How to Puzzle Cache book. How did you uh, go about uh, picking them uh, in figuring out which ones would be appropriate to actually translate into caches? Um, I, I went through the book, just made up a big list of things that tickled my fancy. And then as I went along, I just randomly picked one from my list. I tried to mix them up in difficulty. Uh, I didn't want to overload people too much at the very beginning. So I threw some very simple ones out at the beginning. And uh, um, yeah, I just kind of randomly did it. I had no pattern to it. Uh, I threw out a difficult one every few just to keep people, just to give people something to chew on. Some of them took a while. I think the longest one, they still they still solved it within seven days. So these were not extremely difficult puzzles. Um, they were meant to be illustrative. Sure. Uh, but you didn't go like, you know, increasing difficulty or something in the uh, uh, strategy. So it's just, it wasn't like one is easy, five is a little harder. It's just you tried to kind of put the easier ones at the start and then let things fall as they may. Uh, a few easy ones at the start, but then it was mostly random. I just threw them out there. No particular order to them. See, I was wondering if there was some way that you had uh, figured out a rating for difficulty of puzzles. Because what's easy for one person is really hard for someone else. And a hard puzzle to me is like, oh, here, this is how you solve it. It drives me nuts sometimes because I can go, I can't figure this out. Oh, it's really easy yeah. here. Done. Well, it, one, a puzzle that I thought would take a very long time for it to be solved, they solved it very quickly. Um, I, I, I don't know if you wanted me go, to go into some details, but uh, there's, there's one that I really liked. Uh, it, it, it was a way of illustrating, sometimes you see on a, on a cache page some text, but it's not text. It's a picture. Uh, why would somebody do that? It's because the text is not important. It's the picture that's important. Or, or they just don't want you to copy and paste it into a, a search engine, for example. Sure. But in my case, it's because I wanted them to look at it as a picture. And of course, uh, a lot of people looked at it as text and were trying to figure out the text. They were counting letters and counting words and that sort of thing. And that, of course, was of no value at all. And... Uh, when you finally got down to it, what you were looking for is you were looking for one pixel in every paragraph that was misplaced. And if you figured out where it was located, that, that easily converted into a number. And there were nine paragraphs, so you got nine numbers out of it. I thought that would take forever for them to find. <laughs> so they're, they must be eagle-eyed or they have very high zoom levels. Um, and they found it very quickly. Interesting. So, but that's a that that's an interesting way to challenge them. But that's not the only way that you've done uh, coordinates in a picture in an image, as I understand it. Yeah, there's there's quite a few different ways uh, to put coordinates in a picture. Of course, one way which I incorporated is is uh, I, actually I took a lot of flack for it. Um, I found a picture of an oak tree, very nice looking oak tree. And I think I put it in five or six different puzzles, just a picture of an oak tree. And they had to figure out 
what it was about that picture. I mean, uh, on the cast page, it looked identical to every other one, but there was something unique about it. Uh, of course, the simplest way is you find some very small area of the picture, and in a very slightly different color, you put the put the coordinates in. And so people have to zoom in and look very, very closely, and eventually they'll find some numbers. So that was one of the ways to do it. Um, another way, um, I use JPEG images. And when you learn a little bit about JPEG, what you find is, is that it's not a very difficult protocol. Um, it starts out, the first two hexadecimal characters are FFD8. And the last two characters, or four characters, are FFD9. Okay, that's what defines a JPEG file. The interesting thing is, it doesn't care what's after the FFD9. At the end of the file, you could put in gigabytes if you wanted, and it doesn't care. So what you can do is you can take another image or information or text or anything like that and put it at the end. And as far as anything that uses JPEG is concerned, that's un unuseful information, so it ignores it. So you had I don't to. Think I've never done anything like that. Yeah, basically, what you had to do is you had to open up the file with a simple text editor, go all the way to the end, and start looking there. Um, <laughs> so that's a good way to do it. Um, let's see. Uh, what were some of the other ones? I was going to say one of the more common ways that they've done the. Uh, uh, coordinates is they'll just drop them in as the location in the EXIF data. Yes, EXIF is. To do and... Yeah, you use an EXIF reader, and uh, it shows the data very easily. Um, well, and most of the uh, smartphones now, if you just take that uh, picture, save it to your uh, device, and open it up, it will even give you the link, uh, however that is, to yeah. the map, and it won't give you necessarily the coordinates, but it gives you the map, and you can just use that. Yeah, I've actually uh, I've actually ruined some puzzles because when I look through the log, somebody puts a uh, picture in there, and I have a plugin that automatically shows the EXIF data, and it pops up where they were standing when they took their picture. And so, <laughs> I have to be careful to ignore those those pictures. We actually had off. a question about that uh, four or five months ago. Someone didn't realize that when they were taking the photos and uh, uh, posting them, it was keeping the uh, location information. So yes. you can actually turn that off if you want to continue to take the photos and post them. But yeah, the ground speak does not strip that out when you post it with your logs. Right. Right. They don't. Um, another way to hide things in pictures, of course, is to use steganography. I did, I did make use of uh, one picture that way. Um, the problem with steganography is, is that it can be very dependent on the utility that you use. So some, some ways of encoding using steganography can only be decoded using the same utility, and that can be a problem. Um, I tend to, I use uh, geocachingtoolbox.com a lot, and they've got a steganography decoder in there that worked very well. Uh, so that was one way that I, that I hid something in the image that worked real well. Actually, what I did is I, uh, I hit a barcode in the image. And so when you decode it and find the barcode, of course, it's obvious what you have to do, convert it to a number. That worked uh, very well. That's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. And, of course, QR codes uh, are buried in everything, but that's a lot harder to hide in a photo. That's hard to hide in a photo. I did, use a, I did do a QR code puzzle, but what I did was... Uh, I just took the image and digitized it as ones and zeros. Uh, so if you have a grid for uh, a matrix or something, for example, you could fill it back in. I had um, 441 uh, binary characters, and what you had to realize was is that's 21 squared. So you, you take those digits, put it into a 21 by 21 matrix, and it makes a nice little QR thing which you look at, and it gives you the gives you the coordinates. That was a oh, one wow. way to do it. Yeah. Yikes. That, that <laughs> would that would probably be a little more work than I'd be willing to do to be honest. <laughs> but that, I love the puzzle. That was very strange. Someone discovered someone figured that out within a couple hours. Oh, no thought, doubt. But I thought oof. that one would work. That one would last a while. 
<laughs> yeah, and probably some of the simpler ones just stay out there for days. Before stay someone for finds days, them. yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. Wow, that's pretty cool. Um, so you also had uh, uh, something on uh, uh, number 16 of the series uh, using the uh, um, ground speaks uh, link to hide the cords. Oh, yeah, that's a very interesting thing. Um, what I did is I made up a cache page, and I, I, I put in a related web page link to it. Um, they, these used, used to be able to do automatically. They've, they've taken that feature out, but you can still put it in manually. It's, it's not difficult. So I had a link in there that had a related web page. And when you click on it, it just took you back to the web page you were on. Okay. But here's the thing. When you, when GroundSpeak, when geocaching.com looks at a link, a URL for a cache page, it ignores everything after the GC number. Okay, you'll you'll notice it's geocaching.com slash geocache.gc74ga1 or something like that. Anything after that GC number, it totally ignores. So in the URL, I encoded the coordinates there. And if you click on it, of course, it just takes you back to the same web page. It was only if you actually examined the URL that you saw that information was there. Groundspeak never paid any attention to it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so that's a way uh, that's of hiding a, information. Yeah, I, I've never heard of that one either. So that was a good one. That Were it not for this conversation, I wouldn't have known. Uh, oh, you also have... Uh, oh, go ahead. I was going to say something not too different. Um, we tend to think of caches by the GC number. But GroundSpeak keeps track of them by a, a hexadecimal number. And it, it, it bears no resemblance to the GC number. Um, and so uh, PhysiCalc, which is a utility that's easy to use, has a nice little feature in it. Is it'll take a GC number and it'll convert it to that hexadecimal number. And that's a way of encoding information. I've got, I've got a... Uh, I, I, one of my puzzles is it's a cache page and it says, uh, you know, I really like these caches. And I listed the GC numbers and the titles and that sort of thing. If you go to them, they're just regular caches. There's nothing that leads you, nothing that gives you any information that leads them back to this page. But if you took the GC numbers from the caches I listed, ran them through that converter, you came up with the coordinates for where my final was. So Interesting. Yeah. Most people don't know about that. Yeah, I'll have to uh, hook at that one and try to figure yeah, that one out. That's in that's in Collie's book. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. See, I, I missed that one entirely. Yeah. Uh, but you have another uh, uh, topic you wanted to mention, which is uh, when text is not text. Oh, I, I kind of mentioned that <clears throat> when I when I talked about the uh, the cache that. Uh, uh, where the, the text oh, the image made no difference. It, it was the image. It, it, if, if someone provides a cache page that has text, but it's as an image, there's a reason for that. Because um, it's actually harder to, to, to produce a page like that than it is to just type in the text, right? Um, so sometimes when you see text on a cache page, but it's presented as an image, you look at it as an image instead of text. Right, right. So, and you can do all sorts of things. All, the way we hide, uh, we, with what we just talked about, different ways of hiding information in an image. Um, that's what they're doing there. Uh, ignore the text. On the subject of images, though, uh, Ed in the uh, chat asked if the EXIF data is removed when you're uh, posting the photos on uh, uh, the logs. And the answer was, no, it is not, but... If I remember, and it's been long enough that I've forgotten exactly what happens, but if I, if I remember, if it's over a certain size, geocaching.com resizes it. When they do resize it, then it strips it out. Ah, okay. So it's only in the original image that is kept. So if you upload like a full resolution photo from your uh, um, Pixel 2 or something like that, 
it's going to keep the EXIF data. Or it's going to strip it because it's too big and it has to resize it. But if you send it through the apps, it's downsizing that in the app, not on the website. And therefore, it retains the EXIF data because the tools that they're using on the phone maintain the EXIF data when it downsamples the image. Okay. I know it does sometimes because I see them. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it's not all the time. And you can, of course, turn off the uh, geotagging on your uh, camera to keep right. to keep that from happening. But if you leave it on one time and do it, then, you know, it, it's there. And it's easy to forget yourself for it. Yeah. 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 And when you post photos, you can always go in with an EXIF editor and strip all that stuff out. Yeah. Yeah. If, if you're posting it from the app, you generally don't have that option. There are some tools on the phones that will do that for you, but don't use the camera in the, you know, geocaching your oh, app. And, I see. I'm yeah. old fashioned. I, I, I tend to bring my pictures home. <laughs> I play with them. I put them on my desktop. I sort them out and then I, then I log them. Yeah. I used to do that. Don't do that so much anymore. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, you, you've got to tell me about this next comment that you have here about singing your cache coordinates. How are you oh. singing your cache coordinates? Okay, it's very, it's not very well known. Uh, about over 100 years ago, 150 years ago, a guy came up with a language that you can sing, okay? Every word in the language is made up of um, syllables that are one of the uh, seven notes do re mi fa so la ti okay and so he combines these things together in different ways some words are two notes three notes four notes and he made up a language it's called sol resol okay and um, you can convert you can convert English to that language and it shows up as notes and you can make music out of it. So on one of my cash pages, I made up some little story about my song. Wanting to become a songwriter, I made up this song. And <laughs> of course, it's not a very good song. But uh, uh, well, uh, it, it, but what you do is you take the notes, uh, use the soul, use a soul or soul decoder, and it converts them back to numbers. So you can actually sing the coordinates for your cash. It's that's that's a little bit freaky. Yeah, it's it's freaky. Um, I don't think he got very far <laughs> with promoting this language, but it is out no. there. Yeah. I can't imagine he did. <laughs> Was this a, about the time where everyone seemed to be generating their own languages? Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, back in the late uh, 19th century, there were a huge number yeah. of artificial languages. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then you have another note about uh, turning cache coordinates into a map. How does that work? Oh, okay. Um, also not very well known. Uh, one of my favorite websites is Omniglot, omniglot.com. Uh, it, it is a site that lists an enormous number of fonts and, and languages and that sorts of thing. Um, one way to make a puzzle cache is to just take take words and coordinates and convert, convert them into some artificial language, another language, Klingon, whatever you want to use. But one of the lesser known fonts, it's actually very difficult to find. Um, it takes, it takes um, every letter and converts it into a line segment, um, a vertical line segment at a 45 degree angle, horizontal line segment. And then it combines them to make other characters, of course. So it'll, you might have a 45 degree angle segment and then might have a right angle. You know, you might be going up to the right and then down to the right. Um, so uh, w what you do is, is you take your characters and you make a line, you make a route out of them. You make a line out of them and you put it on a map. And uh, on the cache page, well, the story was that on the cache page, I found this map, and at the end of the, uh, there's a route on the map, and at the end, there's a treasure. Of course, <laughs> the treasure is the, the cache. But you, what you do is you take the route, and you decode it back into characters using this, using this language. 
Um, the language is, uh, the font, the language is called Gerenreich. Uh, mm. It's not easy to find, but if you do a search, you can find it on Omniglot. Um, Interesting. That's, that's one that took a while. Um, and I would have thought that was a, uh, a letterbox if I had just stumbled across it and tried to do it. Yeah, yeah. No, but, now, uh, all of these that we've been talking about are part of that We're All Crazy uh, Here series of caches. Correct. So that's just one series has all of these different types of caches for people to uh, try their hand at. Right. And, and I've been talking about some of the more difficult ones. There's a lot of very easy ones. Uh, there's a few Morse code ones in there, that sort of thing. Semaphores, those aren't usually very challenging. Okay, Starcasher in the uh, chat is uh, uh, getting into some uh, geekier stuff here. That reminds me of the Batman episode where he had to sing notes to have a music sheet punch machine to punch around him and Robin. <laughs> I wasn't familiar with that. No, I, I'm not familiar <laughs> with that episode either. Not that I was much of a Batman you know, viewer when I was a kid, but that that sounds like something that would be have been on the uh, original Batman. Thanks for bringing that up. That was funny. <laughs> All right. You know what, though? We are running a little long that we probably don't want to talk about uh, everything that we've got on here. But maybe let's talk about uh, uh, your A New Hope cache, and then we'll call it quits. All right. Uh, that was a labor of love. Um, I, like, I like things that are called one-time pads. It's a way of encrypting information. It was actually used by spies for a long time. A one-time pad is, uh, it's a pair of identical pads, and on each, on each sheet of paper on the pad is a random set of, of, of letters, okay? But it's, a, it's important that the two pads have the, same, have the same sheets. So one spy takes it, goes off to another country. He takes that pad and encodes a message in it, sends the encoded message to another person, and that person uses the corresponding sheet on his pad to decode it. And when they're done, they tear the, they tear the sheet off and they throw it away. So then they use the next, next time they use the next sheet on the pad. If the letters are truly random, it is, unde it is undecipherable. It cannot be cracked. Uh, that's the advantage. That's the advantage of it. Um, the way it works is it's actually relatively simple. On the pad, um, if there's a letter A, you take the original letter and you move it up one letter. So A becomes B. Um, if the letter on the pad is a B, you move it up two letters. So A becomes C. So you're just shifting letters. It's kind of like rote 13 that everybody's familiar with, but you're just shifting it a different number of spaces depending upon the letter that's on the pad. Okay. And you decode it by just shifting back the opposite direction. It's fairly simple. Geocaching Toolbox has a nice coder and decoder that works very well. All but the right. trick is finding the uh, original pad to use. That's right. If you don't have the sheet on the pad, and because they're random characters, you don't stand a chance. Okay. The, 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 the interesting thing about it is if you have the decoded, if you have the encoded message, um, and you're trying to find the key, the key is the pad, the sheet on the pad. Um, if you're given a different sheet, it can decode to a different message. Okay, depending upon the, the letters on the pad, you can decode to many different messages. These are red herrings. And so I have a cache page where I have the, I have the correct key very well hidden. And then I have sprinkled around these other keys that people discover. And when they take that key and decode it, it gives them a red herring. So um, this cache is called A New Hope. It's reference to the, to the first Star Wars movie. And so, uh, you know, uh, if, you, if you find one of the red herring keys and decode it, you get, uh, uh, help me, Obi-Wan, you're my only hope. Or you get, uh, it's a trap. Or... Uh, uh, <laughs> Do or do not. There is no try. That that 
so there there are references to the to the Star Wars movies that way. But the uh, the trick is to find the correct key because that's the one that decodes your your encoded message to the one that you want, the one that has the coordinates in it. So if you like red herrings, one time pads are great. So, I, I I love the concept. I I don't know that I want to try to. Uh, I may want to try, but I don't know that I want to try to go through all the work of finding all those uh, red herrings and making my way to the actual uh, uh, correct solution. Yeah. But uh, it, it sounds like it could be very frustrating. Well, it was for the first person to solve it. Actually, it didn't take uh, one, one guy found it fairly quickly. And, and of course, once somebody has found it, then I'm willing to give out hints to anybody who asks. Um, so, but I insist that the first person to solve it do it on their own. Yeah, that, and that's fairly common and makes sense. You know, don't take away the fun from people who are legitimately trying to solve the puzzle first. Right. That right. that's where the puzzle caches are. It's not in signing the log first. It's the first to solve the puzzles. Yes. Well, thank you so much for uh, joining us and uh, sharing a little bit of how your puzzles worked and how you came up with all those uh, great ideas and hopefully that helped uh, uh, our uh, uh, ZQX questionnaire and uh, many other people. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity. And of course, we'll link to your uh, profile and some of your caches in the show notes, but are you going to be at any of the uh, major events that people might bump into you? Well, I'll be at Geo Woodstock and of course, uh, going caching. I will there not miss go. going caching. I try to make it as I can. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, I'm going to miss going caching this year, oh, but uh, oh. maybe we'll run into each other at uh, Woodstock. Okay. Yes, I will be there. And we've got several great shows coming up in the uh, next four weeks. We've got Randomize uh, coming up next week, and we've got uh, Gary from Geotalk joining us for that one. Then Land Monkey is going to join us on the 26th, for earth caching. It's only the second time we're doing an earth caching show, which I don't know how that happened. Uh, then on the 3rd of May, we're going to be talking about geocaching competitions. And this is going to be talking about how to keep yourself and others, hopefully, motivated through competitions and setting goals. So Geo Monkey Tiger of the Georgia Geocachers Association is going to be on to do that one. Then on the 10th, we're going to be talking about attending Megas and Gigas. So anyone who's going to uh, Geo Woodstock, this is going to be just in time to pick up, hopefully, a couple more of those tips. But it's going to be for anyone who wants to hit any of these Mega and Giga events. And to that end, we've got uh, Memphis Mafia of Geotalk and Sherman 18, both of whom love those Mega and Giga events. And they'll be joining us to talk about their tips, tricks, and what to keep in mind. So check the Cache Maniacs website at cachemaniacs.com for more on the Geo Gearheads, including show notes for this and all of our episodes. We love hearing from our listeners, so leave us feedback by emailing geogearheads at cachemaniacs.com or through social media. Your support helps keep the Cache Mania shows coming. Please consider becoming a patron through the link on our website to support the Geo Gearheads. Geo Gearheads is produced by Chris Hoffenauer and Daryl Wanberg. This show is copyright 2018 by Daryl Wanberg. All rights reserved.